Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, we will pick up our discussion of pulmonary vascular disease, now focusing on the specific disorders. Here are the players, and we'll start our discussion with chronic hypoxia. Chronic hypoxia causes vasoconstriction, which is also referred to as an increase in pulmonary resistance by the NBME, especially in questions about high altitude. Although I previously mentioned pulmonary parenchymal diseases such as COPD or interstitial lung disease can cause pulmonary hypertension, any cause of hypoxia will do it. Be prepared to see questions about pulmonary hypertension when discussing acclimatization to high altitude. They love to compare twin brothers. One is living at sea level working at Starbucks in Seattle. The other lunatic brother is in the process of self-discovery living at high altitude in the Him Himalayas. The brother at elevation is hyperventilating. He's developed respiratory alkalosis, but also has elevated pulmonary artery pressure secondary to hypoxic vasoconstriction. Remember from our hematology discussion, acclimatization to altitude takes place through increased red blood cell mass, but the PaO2 remains low. Severe obstructive sleep apnea can also raise pressures. The mechanism is hypoventilation. The PCO2 rises while the PO2 decreases. This change occurs roughly in direct proportion. Be prepared to see sleep apnea questions that describe chronic hypoxia and elevated pulmonary artery pressure. So let's look at pulmonary hypertension secondary to cardiac disease. Passive congestion can also cause pulmonary venous hypertension. For orientation, we have a chest x-ray with a large heart and right-sided effusion. The effusion is secondary to congestive heart failure, so it would be a transidate. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is elevated at 25 millimeters of mercury. The high left heart pressures are passively transmitted back to the right heart. The high left-sided pressures put the congestion in congestive heart failure and would be clinically manifest by rails or crackles. The box summarizes what we need to know about pulmonary hypertension related to heart failure. High left-sided pressures cause high right-sided pressures, and this is the most common cause of right-sided heart failure. Right heart failure, secondary to left heart failure, is not considered core pulmonale. As you'll see in the cardiology section, the NBME is not subtle about congestive heart failure. You won't struggle to figure out when they are describing LV failure. Specifically, the physical exam will mention the presence of S3 gallop, as well as the presence of RALS. When they mention clear lungs, it will not be LV failure. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, if they offer you a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, the patient does not have congestive heart failure. So CHF is included in our discussion of pulmonary vascular disease as it is a common cause of pulmonary hypertension and will need to be considered in the differential diagnosis in these patients' vignettes. Just for completeness, I again include the left or right shunt as a cause of pulmonary hypertension. This will be covered in cardiology and is rarely the target of a pulmonary hypertension question. So these are the main players. The majority of pulmonary vascular questions will relate to the rest of the material covered in this section. This photomicrograph pretty much tells the story of primary pulmonary hypertension, also called pulmonary arterial hypertension. If you understand the pathology, you pretty much understand the condition. So what are we seeing? First, note we are looking at a disease of the small arteries and arterioles, so we are nailing a large cross-section of the pulmonary vasculature. Next, look at the arterial wall. Closest to the lumen, you see evidence of intimal hyperplasia and hypertrophy of the media in the adjacent layer. As a result of these proliferative changes, you see a narrowing of the vessel lumen. And this is the disease, a proliferative process that manifests as an occlusive or obliterative arteriopathy. The end result is progressive pulmonary artery hypertension. Having done the heavy lifting, let's answer the following related questions, and then we've nailed the condition. So who gets this, and what is the cause? What is the natural history? And since this is the boards, they do ask how treatment underscores the underlying pathophysiology. So who gets it? Idiopathic and familial make up the majority. The other key association is with autoimmune disorders. Of those disorders, diffuse systemic sclerosis is the most important. In fact, the vascular pathology is identical. Be aware of this overlap. Expect to see evidence of pulmonary artery hypertension manifested by shortness of breath and allowed S2 in a patient with systemic sclerosis. Then they ask the derivative questions about the pathogenesis. Insofar as primary pulmonary hypertension and the NBME, familial will appear most commonly as in the mother died from a progressive pulmonary disorder and now the daughter is short of breath. 
it won't be subtle. Why does this occur? Two key points. There is a defect in the bone morphogenetic receptor protein. This protein is in the family of transforming growth factors and leads to a busy cascade of events. Did you catch that? They will ask about the disease mediator, TGF-beta. So basically, if I asked you to come up with ways to occlude a vessel, these events would be on your short list. Smooth muscle proliferation, loss of vasodilation, increased vasoconstriction, and ultimately vessel fibrosis with secondary thrombosis. I mention these effects on vascular biology because they become targets of therapy and the NBME loves to use pharmacotherapy to assess your understanding of physiology. We'll cover therapy in one moment. What's the natural history? Progressive right heart failure with hypertrophy and or dilation of the right ventricle. Tricuspid regurge develops as the chamber enlarges. They do like to ask about the specific cause of death, which is core pulmonale. It makes sense if you think about it, you just need to think about it. And before leaving primary pulmonary hypertension, a word on treatment and thereby vascular biology. So vasodilation can be achieved through prostacyclin. Prostacyclin decreases intracellular calcium through cyclic AMP and ultimately inhibiting myosin light chain kinase. Vasodilation can also be achieved through the nitric oxide pathway, which increases cyclic GMP and reuptake of cytoplasmic calcium, also inhibiting myosin light chain kinase. Vasoconstriction can also be achieved via endothelin, which increases inositol triphosphate and thereby intracellular calcium. Okay, so what's the relevance of this drivel? Treatment people treatment. The therapies reflect vascular biology. If you want vasodilation, give prostanoids. They increase cyclic AMP and decrease intracellular calcium. If you want more vasodilation, give a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, sildenafil. Cyclic GMP sticks around longer when not degraded by phosphodiesterase. The more cyclic GMP, the lower the intracellular calcium and the more vasodilation. This is the same mechanism of action for erectile dysfunction, vasodilation of the corpora cavernosa. If you want to inhibit vasoconstriction, use an endothelin receptor antagonist in the form of bosentin. Any and all of these agents are used, but guess which ones appear on the exams? Of course, it's the endothelin receptor antagonist. It's most obscure, really. That's the one they ask because they know it flies beneath your radar screen. And that concludes our discussion of primary pulmonary hypertension. Let's move forward in our discussion of pulmonary vascular disorders, focusing on obstructive etiologies in the form of thromboembolic disease. You will need to be aware of the following. Who's at risk? Signs and symptoms? Diagnostics with the important subtheme of pathophysiology? Therapeutics will not be discussed in this section. The patient with thromboembolic disease will receive anticoagulation, but the full review of anticoagulation will appear in the hematology section. Do be aware that all that embolizes is not a thrombus. Fat, amnion, air, tumor, and cholesterol all embolize. Besides thrombus, the NBME does like to include a question on fat emboli, so we'll cover that at the end of this section. I won't cover amniotic emboli, but in many ways it is similar to fat emboli in that it also causes ARDS, DIC, and shock. You're advised to be aware of the risk factors and demographics, as well as the diagnostic tests, as they reflect the pathophysiologic derangements. So who's at risk? This is a little anticlimactic, but it is functional and easy to remember. Verkau and his triad. What do we need to pull out of this? Stasis. Pay attention to stasis, as in laying in a hospital bed, for any reason whatsoever. Not to stereotype, but any question that involves a truck driver is a clot. Anyone who flies home from California has a clot. These are all stasis scenarios. Endothelial injury, for all intents and purposes, includes prior clot. They never use this leg of the triad. And then there is thrombophilia. We cover thrombophilia in the hematology section, but be aware of a couple of sneaky considerations. These include, one, oral contraceptives. These aren't really sneaky, but they almost always imply a clot. Be aware of the malignancies that are associated with clot, especially adenocarcinoma of the pancreas, polycythemia vera, and renal cell carcinoma. Insofar as pancreatic neoplasm and migratory thrombophlebitis, they'll present you with one risk factor for cancer, such as chronic pancreatitis. They'll give you one symptom associated with the diagnosis of cancer, such as weight loss or mid-epigastric pain. And then they'll give you a physical exam description suggestive of clot, such as leg swelling and pain. The index episode will resolve in one to two weeks, 
and then he'll experience a similar symptom in the other leg. Dudes, this is migratory thrombophlebitis. It is a paraneoplastic syndrome. Be on the lookout for this one. And finally, I list the inheritable conditions. Of note, they rarely in the question stem. They usually target themselves of inquiry. So do be familiar with these populations at risk and how they present. Signs and symptoms tend to be overt and supportive of the question stem. Shortness of breath, pleurisy, and hemoptysis would be common symptoms. Pay attention to calf or thigh pain, redness, and or swelling. If perineoplastic, they will give you referable symptoms such as weight loss, hematuria, headache, pruritus, or facial plethora. The exam will be nonspecific unless signs of DVT are noted. And here are their favorite questions combining risk factors and signs and symptoms. Number one, patient with signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolism, such as shortness of breath with leg swelling. Then they'll ask you the site. It is a DVT, as in deep vein. They don't say deep vein. Instead, they list every vein you've ever heard of. Look for the deep vein, such as the femoral vein. Patient with transient and recurrent thrombophlebitis. What's the likely diagnosis? This is the migratory thrombophlebitis story but in this instance, they work backward. They can also give you a clot and want you to figure out why it formed. Be aware of the paraneoplastic syndromes associated with pancreatic cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and P. vera. And number three is always a fun one. This is the truck driver, leg swelling, but unfortunately he develops a stroke. Well, how does a venous clot cause an arterial stroke? Needs to traverse a PFO or ASD. Great stuff. Let's move on to the diagnostic studies and link them to important pathophysiology. Here are the players, ABG, nuclear VQ scan, CT angiogram, and D-dimer. The NBME does like to use pulmonary embolism, but very different than on your clinical rotations. They use it to test your understanding of physiology, so let's get to it. We'll start with the ABG. Before advancing the slide, you should have a pretty good awareness of the typical ABG. Think about it. The patient had a PE. They are hypoxic. What is the pulmonary response to hypoxia? Hyperventilation. What does hyperventilation look like on an ABG? Here it is. The patient is alkalotic and the PCO2 is decreased from hyperventilation. The patient with pulmonary embolism will be represented by respiratory alkalosis. Hypoxemia is sensed by peripheral chemoreceptors at the carotid body, which will increase respiratory drive. Hypoxemia is noted with a decreased PaO2. Finally, in the setting of respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys do compensate in an effort to normalize the pH. This is called metabolic compensation. To keep life simple, compensation is always in the same direction as the primary disorder. If the PCO2 is decreased, the renal response will be in the same direction. We cover ABG interpretation in more detail in other sections, but the pulmonary embolism is a splendid opportunity for the NBME to test you on ABG analysis. Next consideration is the basis of the hypoxemia. Why is the PaO2 decreased? The answer is VQ mismatch. You need to be familiar with the concept of mismatch between ventilation, V, and vascular perfusion, abbreviated Q. Here it is in the most simplistic terms. The patient is ventilating fine. There is nothing wrong with the airways and alveoli. This is a vascular problem. The ventilation is normal. And here is the vascular problem. You have a clot interfering with alveolar perfusion. No blood flow means no gas exchange. Ventilation normal, vascular perfusion impaired. This is called VQ mismatch. Let's continue. So VQ mismatch takes us right into the issue of AA gradient. AA gradient in most simplistic terms reflects the difference between alveolar oxygen and arterial oxygen. It is that simple. Under normal circumstances, we have a gradient of approximately 5 to 10. Alveolar oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury, and normal arterial oxygen is around 95. A normal AA gradient would be approximately 5. In the patient with hypoxemia, with the arterial PaO2 drops to 60, there is a widened gradient. Alveolar oxygen is still 100, but the PaO2 has dropped to 60. 100 minus 60 is 40, that is a widened AA gradient. The AA gradient is simply a convention or tool that allows us to categorize causes of hypoxemia. A patient with VQ mismatch due to abnormal perfusion is said to have an increase in dead space, and that makes sense. You are ventilating, but no gas exchange occurs. This is akin to driving your car down a dead end street, in this case represented by the alveolus. At the end of the road, you turn the car around. Nothing happened. 
dead end, dead space. It is a waste. I never drive on dead ends. They remind me of pulmonary emboli. And just for your information, the alveolar oxygen is calculated from Dalton's laws of partial pressures. That is, it's a calculated value. The arterial PaO2 is derived from arterial blood gas analysis. They have to supply this information. You don't have to calculate it. That was big. ABG, renal compensation, VQ mismatch, and AA gradient, all rich fodder for the NBME. So let's move on to nuclear VQ scan. The VQ scan is a visual assessment of the mismatch we just described. In the VQ scan, the patient breathes in a radio-labeled gas, such as xenon. We get a look at the pulmonary gas distribution. Then the patient is injected with a radio-labeled tracer to assess the vascular perfusion pattern. The ventilation and perfusion patterns are compared. We look for areas of decreased perfusion in an area with normal ventilation, that is, VQ mismatch. These tests are called VQ scans. That's pretty convenient. In this scan, we can see normal ventilation in the left apex. However, the perfusion scan demonstrates a defect. There is no perfusion in this area. Ventilation normal, perfusion abnormal. Bingo, the patient is diagnosed with a PE. Nuclear imaging is indicated if the patient has contraindication to CT angiography, such as IV contrast allergy or renal disease. The nuclear scan isn't specifically important to your purposes, but it does offer a visual representation of VQ mismatch. And just as a reminder, this region is referred to as dead space, ventilated but not perfused, another dead end. Okay, we're winding down here. Here are the images of a CT angiogram. Be prepared to see either autopsy or CT angiogram with an arrow pointing to a clot. As always, the graphic will suck and you'll have no idea what they're pointing to, but the vignette gives ample information to determine the diagnosis. Once you figure out they're talking about a pulmonary embolism, they will ask the derivative, like where did the clot come from, the femoral vein, why did they have a clot, occult malignancy with perineoplastic syndrome. You guys are getting good. This isn't that hard, and they are running out of ways to trick you. Finally, we have D-dimer. Not much cooking here. Just be familiar with what it is, how it is used, and the key derivative of how it differs from fiber and split products. So what is it? It's a breakdown product of cross-linked fibrin. Cross-linked is the operative phrase here. That cross-linking comes from activated factor 13. It stabilizes fibrin monomers, but they are in turn broken down by plasmin. That's what creates D-dimers. As D-dimer does derive from cross-linked monomers, it does imply the presence of clot. However, it lacks specificity. That is, we bump, we bruise, we have blood drawn in the hospital, etc. All these things cause little clots. So an elevated D-dimer doesn't tell us we're sitting on a big thrombus, only that a clot is being degraded by plasmin. The D-dimer is best used as a test to exclude the presence of clot. That is, if there are no D-dimers detected, the patient is at low risk of significant clot. Further discussion of this topic gets into step two and step three material. Finally, what's the difference between a split product and D-dimer? It's all this other noise. Split products are even less specific for clot than D-dimer. They can result from the breakdown of fibrinogen as well as early platelet mesh due to minor trauma. This point is the money on a D-dimer question. Why is D-dimer more specific than fibrin degradation products for assessing clot? Answer. It comes from well-formed cross-linked clot. And that's all you need to know about D-dimer. That does it for thromboembolism and derivatives. A few quick slides on fat embolism and we're done. Note the film, displaced fracture of a long bone. That is the setup. So here is the money on this topic. Fat embolism occurs after a long bone injury. These patients are in the hospital and a pulmonary event happens on day two or three. They develop confusion, shortness of breath, and a petechial rash on the upper chest with low platelets. Why are the platelets low? They have adhered to the fat globules. They are consumed. Histology reveals fat globules in the pulmonary arterioles. Fat globules do not belong in blood vessels. This leads to toxic injury from free fatty acids. That injury is manifest as ARDS. Your mission is simple. Distinguish fat embolism from pulmonary embolism.
the platelets, rash, and ARDS will do it. If they don't give you that information, then the patient doesn't have a fat embolism. Be familiar with the pathology. Picture those fat globules in the arterioles. Whereas fat looks pretty when deposited around my midsection, it is toxic while it is in the circulation. And look what I found. Here is the patient with a traumatic femoral fracture, and here is her chest x-ray on day four of the hospitalization. ARDS. Note the endotracheal tube. Oh, you want her platelets? 193,000 on admission, and then a quick decline. Unfortunately, I couldn't grab a photo of the petechial rash, but this patient had a fatty embolism. And there you have it. This was a long journey, but we integrated a lot of material, including some of the key pathophysiology the NBME likes to assess. If you have any questions, email me at 12 Days in March. Thank you.